a todas. Muchas gracias por su presencia. Queremos eh, agradecerle a todos los que han asistido a este Congreso Internacional sobre Comunicación y Cultura Popular que tuvo una preconferencia dedicada a los 40 años de la nacionalización de la cueca en Chile. Ha sido una semana intensa. Especialmente queremos dar las gracias a las personas que han venido desde otros países. Sabemos que es un gran esfuerzo que en algún momento nos ha tocado a nosotros hacer. Muchas gracias por viajar desde lejos, por escribir, por intentar adaptarse a la ciudad, a los hoteles, al sistema de conferencia y especialmente por sortear este cambio de sede que tuvimos hoy debido a las demandas sociales de los estudiantes que, que creemos vale la pena tener en cuenta. Bien, eh, hoy cerramos entonces eh, nuestra conferencia con, con la última participación que es la de Bart Kmaertz. Eh, estamos muy contentos de que haya venido, hemos tenido un diálogo muy fructífero con él y creo que ha sido también importante tener a una persona que pueda hacer un diálogo eh, norte-sur. ¿no? Bar también estuvo recientemente en Brasil, desde donde, está, donde estaba recién, en Río de Janeiro. Así que hemos tenido el, la gentileza de contar con él. Bart Kamertz es doctor en Ciencias Sociales y magíster en Ciencias Políticas por la Universidad de Bruselas, Bélgica. Es bachiller en Ciencias Políticas en esta misma institución y bachiller en Trabajo Social eh, de un instituto, no sé cómo pronunciarlo. La verdad. Bueno. No, no es tan importante. Okay. Un instituto de Economía, voy a decirlo así, ¿ya? Eh, de Amberes, Bélgica. Actualmente es profesor de Política y Comunicación en el Departamento de Medios eh, y Comunicación de la London School of Economics. Inglaterra, donde también es director del Máster en Medios y Comunicación. Ha sido además presidente de la sección de Comunicación y Democracia de la Asociación Europea de Comunicación e Investigación y vicepresidente de la sección de Comunicación, Tecnología y Política de la Asociación Internacional para la Investigación de Medios y Comunicación. Su investigación actual tiene como objetivo la relación entre medios, comunicación y resistencia, con especial énfasis en las estrategias de los activistas de medios, las representaciones de la protesta en los medios, las contraculturas alternativas y los problemas mayores relacionados al poder, la participación y la propaganda comercial. Es decir, todos los temas que hemos tratado en este Congreso. Por eso es muy pertinente esta participación final. Y antes de, de darle la palabra a Bart, Quiero recordarles que tenemos un, un, una pequeña sorpresa, una pequeña, pequeña alimentación al final para cerrar y decirles que además de todo esto, Bart es eh, DJ, es músico y también participa en las radios con mucha frecuencia. Démosle un aplauso entonces a Bart Kamaitz. Gracias. Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, Qué apropiado dar mi discurso hoy en un auditorio que tiene este slogan a la entrada, el mayor patrimonio de Chile es la lucha permanente de los estudiantes. Um, antes de comenzar mi presentación quería agradecer a los organizadores del Congreso, Chiara, Antonieta, los dos cristianos, uh, para invitarme, pero también para uh, hacerme sentir muy bienvenido aquí. Uh, también uh, quiero agradecer a toda la gente que han trabajado detrás de las escena para hacer de esta conferencia una, exper una experiencia suave uh, y estimulante para nosotros. Um, finalmente, me gustaría disculparme para dar mi presentación en inglés. Uh, como puedes escuchar, mi español no es tan malo, uh, pero me siento más cómodo uh, dar, uh, desarrollando un argumento académico uh, e e e intelectual en inglés. Hay una traducción simultánea neo, uh, disponible uh, si quieres. Uh, switching to English. Um, so for me it was very refreshing to uh, hear you all talk uh, about popular culture, especially because in the north popular culture is very much, or I would say too much, seen as uh, the culture which is popular, 
uh, which is mass culture, which is the culture that uh, mass media produces for people. Uh, and what I see uh, in this conference and in, 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 in the work that has been done in the project that lies behind this conference um, is that it's focused much more on uh, the popular culture from below. Uh, uh, the, and, and in Spanish it's also, you, you kind of see that, it's, it's, it, the, el popular is also the, la cultura del, del pueblo. Um, and this, as has also been said uh, at, at, at the beginning of this conference, but I, I also in, in many of your presentations, uh, popular culture also implicates power. Uh, it implicates, and for me, from a, from a more kind of, let's say, post-structuralist perspective, uh, power is intrinsically linked to resistance. It's, in a way, two sides of the same coin. Um, and as such, um, protests uh, and, and social movements are very much, are for me very much part of popular culture uh, as well. And, and that is what I will focus on in my presentation uh, today, uh, discussing a little bit the work that I've been doing in the last couple of years and that I'm also at the moment developing towards looking at, at, at more kind of historical perspective in, in this regard. Um, I will first develop a, a, a few theoretical conceptual building blocks uh, that are, are useful to understand, uh, uh, in a way, the role of media and communication uh, for protest and for social change. Um, also looking not necessarily so much at the content of the popular culture or the content of, of protest, but also bringing in one, also one of the dimensions that was discussed in, 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 in the project on political culture, the materiality of uh, uh, protest and, and of, of media and communication in that context. I will subsequently define what I've developed uh, in, in, in some of my uh, publications, which I've called the mediation opportunity structure, uh, which in a way refers to the dimension of agency and structure in the context of uh, mediation. Uh, and, and, and so media and communication has both opportunities for social movements, but there are also structural constraints that come into play. And, and movements and activists have to navigate this. Um, and I will apply this with examples from, first of all, uh, print cultures, uh, then interpersonal communication, uh, broadcasting, and to end uh, the notion of convergence, which of course refers to the internet where a lot of these media uh, come together. I will also end with some issues uh, and, and, and problems with the concept of alternative media in the context of mediation uh, and activism. So let me first uh, develop a little bit uh, one of the, the first uh, conceptual building block, namely what is called uh, affordance theory. Um, Gibson uh, was actually not necessarily a media and communication scholar, but he was actually a biologist, a uh, social bio biologist. Um, and his theory of affordances uh, tries to explain how the environment uh, surrounding an animal constitutes a given set of affordances, which are both objective and subjective, which are both perceptible and hidden. Um, and Gibson defines affordances are a unique combination of qualities that specifies the, what the object affords us. So it is also intrinsically linked to a set of actions. What do objects allow us to do? Um, uh, this notion of affordances also became very popular in technology and innovation studies to make sense of uh, our relationship with and our shaping of technologies. And so uh, media technologies, uh, <coughs> of which the internet and mobile technologies are, of course, the most recent ones, but we can also go back to print cultures, as I will do, uh, and, and letters, uh, telecommunication, uh, etc. Uh, 
hold a set of affordances that are inherent to them, but also need to be recognized uh, by, uh, in, this, in, my, in the case of my research, by activists. Um, so they are embedded in these objects, and designers can embed certain affordances in them, but there can also be affordances in technologies that uh, are not necessarily uh, in, put in there by, by designers, but are uh, seen uh, by activists. And I'll come back to that uh, in, in, in a minute. Um, so to kind of also uh, end this, this, this definition of, 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 of affordances, uh, it's also a way of kind of break, breaking down the dichotomy that is often constructed between uh, the, the, the object and the subject. Uh, and, and, and think of how a mobile, also, a mobile phone becomes for many people also an extension of ourselves. It allows us to do certain things. Um, and important in this regard is also uh, this, this notion of hidden affordances, that there are affordances in, in objects that are hidden and that can be uncovered uh, in, 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 in due course. Uh, and, and that also relates to a user perspective of technology. Uh, as, I, as I said, uh, a social constructivist perspective on technological innovation uh, that opens up a space for user resistance, uh, for innovation and also for uh, creativity. Um, and we can see here affordance theory is a useful tool for user-centered analysis uh, of uh, technologies and it captures this relationship uh, as Buchner and Hellman points out between the materiality of media and human agency. Um, to kind of give a few more concrete uh, examples uh, we can, for example, refer to the spatial dimension and how media and communication affordances collapse distance uh, through uh, telecommunication or through the internet, where, whereby in distance is being uh, collapsed. Uh, there's also a temporal dimension in terms of affordances. You can have media that allow uh, asynchronous forms of communication. Uh, you write a letter, and that arrives a few days later uh, somewhere else. Or you receive an email and you decide when you, re when you read it. Uh, but it's, oh, it, it, it is there. Uh, or real-time forms of communication, like broadcasting, like radio, like uh, telecommunication. Um, there's also a directional dimension to of media and communication affordances, in the sense of it enables or affords private forms of communication or more public forms of communication, more broadcast-oriented or more point-to-point -point forms of communication uh, that are more private. Uh, and there's also a resistance dimension there uh, in terms of how media and communication technologies also allow circumvention of limitations that are being put in place by, let's say, the powers that be. Um, and hacking is a good example of that, and I will return to that example later. But building on this notion of social constructivism, it's also important to understand that, as I said earlier, that designers might develop media and communication technologies in a particular way, but that users can also uh, in a way, shape this in a different direction, or uh, as, as this, this uh, image sho shows, uh, the design might be in some way, but users decide to do something else with it. Uh, to put it very bluntly, uh, Facebook, for example, was not invented to coordinate or mobilize for protest movements, and that is this example of this hidden affordance. Uh, uh, that affordance was always there in that platform, but activists recognize that affordance in the platform to use it in that particular way. Um, so it leaves room for imagination and creativity. Another body of theory that is a good building block in this regard is that these affordances obviously also afford access activists with a set of practices. Uh, and that opens up 
uh, the notion of uh, practice uh, theory. Uh, my good colleague Nick Coldry uh, calls media practices the things that people do with media. And this obviously also brings in this materiality. Uh, and also, this theory, in a way, uh, has been developed and became popular in recent years as a reaction against the dominance in our field uh, of media and communication, that is, of looking at content and, and analyzing content, uh, and thereby uh, a kind of underemphasis of what are people now actually doing with media, and obviously with uh, internet and, and these kind of technologies becoming more, more and more popular, we, we also have this user perspective that looks more at kind of practices rather than only at the content that is being produced through these media and distributed through these media. Um, again, here we see uh, uh, a dialectic or, or, or uh, between a structure uh, and agency in terms of what uh, practices are, are enabled and what are the limitations that are being put in place uh, for to, to thwart certain uh, practices. Um, it also brings in, uh, I would say, uh, as, as uh, Ortner uh, pointed out, a historical culturalist perspective, which makes it also interesting for, for what I would, I would like to do, because uh, she also says that a theory of practice is inevitably also a theory of uh, history as more things become possible uh, to, to do. Um, uh, and, and also stresses the importance of a temporal dimension of memory, of tradition, uh, but also of renewal with regard to uh, practices. Um, and this also foregrounds the impact of, on practices, uh, foregrounds the inevitability of the political and how practices are always shaped by power, by inequalities, by access, by asymmetries. Um, which is also important to uh, point out. Um, so, activist mediation practices uh, shifts the focus uh, from a focus on audiences and users also towards uh, media production and meaning making through these practices. Uh, it's an activity that constitutes media meaning uh, and we, we can also see that activist practices, uh, if, if we then bring it uh, towards the, the social movement realm, uh, is what activists do with media and communication technologies in their efforts to disseminate their movement discourses and frames and to mobilize for uh, direct uh, action. Um, activist mediation practices are, of course, also circumscribed, as I, I mentioned earlier, this dialectic between structure and agency works at this level. Uh, they are circumscribed by the perceived as well as hidden affordances of media and communication technologies. And as I will show in my in more empirical examples and historical examples, also by the persistent efforts uh, by the powers that be to limit the emancipatory potential of these technologies and of uh, these uh, objects. Um, as such, I would argue with uh, Meyer, who is more a social movement uh, 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 scholar, uh, that the wisdom, creativity, and outcomes of activist choices, so in other words, their agency, can only be understood and evaluated by looking at the political context and the rules of the game in which those choices are made, and that is uh, structure. And that, uh, in a way, uh, opens up the concept of the political opportunity structure, and I argue that this political opportunity structure intersects with the mediation opportunity structure. Here, for example, looking at kind of using objects for things that they are not intended is an example, recent example, of uh, the, the, the protests in, in Hong Kong, uh, who started using uh, laser pens uh, to, to uh, direct at the police who is using facial recognition technology. Uh, so it's an example, these laser pens are not necessarily designed or made to 
uh, use it in that way, but activists, uh, their creativity, they kind of see that opportunity to and, 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 and mobilize and, and, and use uh, social media and, and internet tools to, to, to mobilize people to bring these pens. Uh, and so you, you have hundreds and hundreds of, of, of protesters directing these pens to, to, to the police cameras to, to avoid uh, uh, being recognized by, by the facial recognition technology. Um, moving to the mediation opportunity structure, as I uh, developed uh, this, um, and I based myself in, in, in many ways, or I was inspired in many ways by uh, Martin Barbero, and, and with Chiara, we had a discussion earlier that um, you sometimes see different things in, in, in Martin Barbero than, 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 than we in the North, uh, not necessarily always. But one of the things that I was very useful to me was to link this notion of mediations and, and bringing together media as well as communication uh, with explicitly with, with social movements and, 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 and uh, what he says, the, the articulation of different tempos of development and, and again, practice, the practices. Um, and so what I did in, 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 in my latest book, uh, The Circulation of Anti-Austerity Protest, uh, is develop uh, what I call a circuit of, of protest. Uh, again, inspired by the cultural study, uh, Stuart Hall, the gay uh, circuit of, of culture, uh, I looked at the production of movement uh, discourses, frames, and identities, at the uh, self-mediation, or what you would call audio mediation, uh, of m movement discourses, frames, and identities. I did content analysis in the kind of mainstream representations of these discourses, and also surveys and focus groups in terms of how these discourses and frames are being received by let's say, ordinary non-activist uh, citizens. Um, by the way, if somebody wants this movie, I don't like my publisher to charge so much money. So if you want uh, a PDF copy, just send me an email. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sharing is caring, as they say. Um, <laughs> uh, so obviously, uh, as, as I kind of pointed out, uh, there is obviously an interconnection here between, uh, and that is something that will become very apparent in the examples, between the mediation opportunity structure uh, and the various uh, structural intervention that aim to limit the agentic opportunities of uh, various media and communication uh, uh, technologies. Um, at the same time, as, as I've explained in the beginning, adopting a kind of post-structuralist view of power uh, and, and, and uh, kind of pro that power is inherently productive, uh, that we will also see that there's a lot of evidence that agency leads to clever and creative uh, workarounds, circumventing these limitations that are being put uh, in place. And we see this uh, throughout uh, history uh, and, and also inevitably also towards the future. The important to kind of point out uh, is that uh, obviously we, we, this, this, there's an interplay here with uh, the classic concept in, in social movement studies of political opportunity structures, uh, which are, if, if we take the, the definition of crazy, those aspects of a political system which determine movement development independently of the purposeful action of the actors uh, involved. Uh, and so we see it's it, political opportunity structure is also in a way political momentum, uh, but there's again opportunity and structure in there. It's bi-directional, it enables and disables at the same time. Uh, there are uh, temporal shifts and spatial differentiations. Uh, what, what, what was possible 30 years ago is maybe not possible now, or is what was not possible then is possible now. Similarly, uh, going and stand with a big banner, uh, fuck Brexit uh, in Trafalgar Square, uh, doesn't get you killed if you do this, uh, the same, but then uh, targeted at the Chinese president uh, in Tiananmen Square, that will have different consequences. Uh, that's also political opportunity structure. 
Um, so let, let's have a look at a number of uh, examples. Um, starting with uh, print cultures. Uh, print cultures had both uh, temporal and spatial uh, affordances as they enabled the asynchronous and gradual spread of movement discourses and ideas uh, throughout uh, society. Um, with technological improvements over time, printed material could also be produced in vast quantities more cheaply and could also be distributed more easily and more widely. Uh, in pre-revolutionary France, for example, we saw a vibrant uh, print culture that, what, as Baker pointed out, demonstrated the dangerous power of the written word to subvert social order by entering into collective processes of political contestation. Of course, in order to reach the uh, urban and rural classes, or what was in revolutionary France called les sans-culottes, uh, visual representations of movement frames through, for example, satirical cartoons were often more important than the printed word because those that were uh, not literate could also uh, uh, understand them. And, and, and this was also obviously a precursor of a satirical press uh, that emerged in uh, the 19th uh, uh, century. Uh, Print remained an important uh, form of, uh, of, of, of uh, public communication for activists and social movements throughout history as print cultures improved through numerous innovations. Uh, and even today, uh, you see, obviously, if you go to a demonstration, you will still get a lot of flyers and, and, and pamphlets, and uh, etc. So we see that this remains an important uh, aspect. Uh, we can also refer to the emergence of a, a proletarian public sphere, as Nicht and Kluge pointed out, uh, uh, and, and these print technologies were subsequently appropriated by new movements that try to also have full control over the means of communication. However, this did obviously not go uncontested. Um, after reviewing 500 years of uh, printing uh, history, uh, Steinberg concludes that governments have continuously and usually successfully tried to introduce some kind of censorship while shamefacedly avoiding that odious, odious name. Uh, so we can see that there are uh, attempts to license printers, uh, to control paper, uh, we see that there are pro, uh, pre and post publication censorship, uh, on, for example, on the eve of the French Revolution, about 200 censors were working for the Ancien Regime, and all publications needed a royal stamp of approval before they could be published uh, officially. Um, we also see that uh, even after the demise of absolute monarchies, political and moral censorship remained firmly in place in the emerging liberal uh, democracies, uh, in despite that kind of claim of, of, of emphasizing freedom of speech, we saw that uh, freedom of speech was, was limited through seditious libel laws, anti-heresy laws, uh, les majeste laws, which you could not insult the monarch, and, and obviously also obscenity uh, laws. Um, resistance against state control of print cultures was also rife. Uh, despite these fervent efforts of the French state, for example, during the pre-French Revolution to contain subversive revolutionary content, circumvention was widespread. Printers in the Netherlands, for example, made uh, a lot of money uh, printing material that was smuggled into France and, and then subsequently uh, distributed through clandestine shops and book peddlers across uh, France. Um, Another common way of circumvention was uh, DIY uh, uh, production, bypassing official uh, printers altogether through, for example, cheap means of self-reproduction. We could refer here to the May 68 uh, silk screen 
print techniques which we saw spreading in many countries, uh, which also ha brought with it, with it a very specific uh, uh, designs, very specific uh, iconography. Um, in Soviet Russia, we could also... Oops, that is gone. But in so Soviet Russia, we could also observe a revival of the Samizdat tradition, uh, where uh, content was typed, uh, or illegal content was typed on carbon, uh, very flimsy carbon paper, so that you, people, or those that were doing it, could make five or, or three or four or five copies at the same time. Uh, and, and then were kind of uh, uh, distributed. Um, and in a way, these were techniques that, that, that were tried and tested uh, before uh, as well. Um, if we move to interpersonal communication, uh, here we see that the emergence of postal services and their affordance of sending letters made it possible to mobilize opinion across large distances. Uh, furthermore, postal services also afforded internal communication within movements with a view to assess and discuss the political context, to coordinate the movement, uh, and to organize direct actions, but also to exchange sensitive uh, information. Uh, Letters were an important means to, for example, distribute news and gossip in the run-up to the French Revolution, and they also played an, an important role during the American Revolutionary War, when political and military leaders used letters as their main mode of communication uh, to discuss strategy and tactics. Uh, and uh, that was the independence struggle against the British, of course. Um, the importance of re and relevance of letters in the context of activism and political struggles, struggles can also be deduced from the publication of letters written by political and intellectual leaders throughout history. And we could refer here to examples, uh, the vast archive of letters sent by uh, Marx and Engels, for example, uh, the letters between Gandhi and Nehru, or Gandhi and Tolstoy, uh, and there are, uh, there are many uh, other examples of this. Um, with the emergence of the telegraph and later on the telephone, also real-time mediated communication over longer distances became a distinct possibility. Especially the telephone, with its affordance to enable real-time one-to-one, point-to-point communication across large distances was ideal for coordinating a movement across distance. The protagonists of the US civil rights protests in the 50s and the 60s, such as Martin Luther King, but also others, amply used telephones to coordinate actions and to distribute information amongst themselves. Uh, Adams, uh, a kind of chronicler of, of the US civil rights movements, uh, pointed out that the telephone functioned to build decentralized social formations, what we would call today networks uh, between people then. Um, also here, we see obviously that this uh, was, uh, uh, that there were important attempts to thwart this, uh, in, and, and mainly through interception and surveillance uh, practices, which happened then and obviously still happen uh, today. Uh, across Europe, so-called cabinet noir, or black chambers, operations were set up inside central post offices. Uh, and these specialized in opening, reading, and resealing correspondence. Uh, it was estimated that during the US Revolutionary War, about half of the correspondence between revolutionary leaders was intercepted uh, by the British. And this practice continued well into the 19th and the 20th century. Uh, it was, for example, a US Attorney General Robert Kennedy that authorized the FBI uh, to wiretap Martin Luther King's uh, Jr.'s telephones. Uh, both as his home and in his office, and transcribing everything that was said, revealing also um, that uh, Martin Luther King was quite promiscuous, for example. Um, many communicative counter practices also emerged geared towards circumventing or mitigating a surveillance by the state. Uh, the letters written by leaders during the US Revolutionary War were often written in code 
Uh, so here we see the, emotion, the emergence of, of, code, of, of trans encryption uh, uh, using invisible ink, for example. Uh, or, or, uh, or Marx also often mentions in, in his, uh, the use of secret addresses uh, unknown to the police and secret services to which letters could be sent uh, more safely. Uh, when it can, comes to telephones, activists suspicious of eave, eavesdropping by the state would avoid saying sensitive things over the telephone uh, or use public telephones, for example, or indeed also coded language uh, or give information that was misleading uh, to, to put the police on a kind of different uh, uh, path. Um, an interesting example in this regard was also the use of uh, what was called uh, Wide area telephone services, uh, watch lines, were used in, in, by the U.S. civil rights movement to distribute sens sensitive information uh, in the south of the U.S., especially about police violence, for example. Uh, these watch lines were similar to uh, 0800 uh, lines, but paid for by organizations part of the movement, and they would be used by activists from the south who wanted to report aggression because there were no white operators involved that could uh, listen, listen, listen to, to what they were uh, uh, reporting. Um, and these, that information would then subsequently be conveyed, which was through what were called Watts uh, reports. Again, circumvention. Radio broadcasting. This, of course, introduced uh, a new era in which public real-time communication became possible, and especially radio proved to be a powerful tool in the hands of activists. It had the affordance of immediacy, uh, and just as with audio or visual prints, literacy is not necessary. Uh, we could, in this regard, refer to the role of radio during the Cuban Revolution, uh, uh, radio stations in Havana and Santiago de Cuba uh, under the control of the Batista regime were often targeted and occupied to distribute a call for national strikes. Uh, furthermore, Che Guevara set up Radio Rebelde in 58, a shortwave radio station located in the Sierra Maestra, a mountain ridge in the south of the island. And later Fidel Castro wrote that the station was an essential tool and vehicle for the dissemination of information and secondly, a means of communication with the outside world. In the same period, we also see that the Algerian independence struggle also appropriated radio as a tool to reach mass audiences. Uh, in a very short time, radio was transformed from a hegemonic instrument in the hands of the French colonizers to an instrument of resistance. Uh, la Voix de l'Algérie Libre et Combattante, which started broadcasting uh, in '56 brought to uh, what Fanon called to all Algeria the great message of the revolution. Owning a radio all of a sudden became a patriotic duty, and in 20 days all the radio sets in the whole of Algeria were sold out. Unsurprisingly, uh, here also we see various tactics and techniques by the powers that be to, to try to limit uh, access to, to, to radio broadcasting. Uh, this went from uh, disrupting the broadcasts of Rebelde and Voice of Free Algeria, uh, jamming their radio signal uh, in Algeria, banning batteries and battery charges, uh, to, to, to uh, seizing radio sets, uh, and also setting up what was called black propaganda uh, radio stations uh, to counter uh, this. Uh, Censorship is, however, not always blatant and direct, as was the case in Cuba and Algeria, but also occur indirectly through regulation, for example, uh, through the issuing or denying of radio licenses. Uh, the physical limitations inherent to the frequency spectrum gave state actors the opportunity to control access to the airwaves. Uh, which led in many countries to state monopolies on broadcasting or commercial networks controlling the airwaves. Uh, and we see obviously here in terms of circumvention uh, the emergence of pirate radio stations in many countries uh, uh, countering that, that state or, or commercial monopolies or oligopolies. 
uh, use of cassettes and videotapes in terms of what was called small media. There's an interesting example there of the Iran uh, Iranian Revolution and Khomeini uh, using the telephone. He was exiled in, in Paris. Uh, and his speeches were uh, dictated by him through the telephone, recorded on cassette tapes, and then subsequently broadcast to large audiences in Tehran uh, with a microphone to a ghetto blaster. Uh, again, circumvention uh, means. Uh, and obviously, more recently, we see also see the, the ability of activists to stream uh, independently uh, uh, using uh, streaming sites. There's jamming taking place. Uh, uh, when we bring in the notion of convergence, uh, obviously we, we bring in uh, the internet uh, as a kind of network of networks which brings together uh, text, audiovisual communication, image, voice, uh, all together in one, one technology. Having said that, the internet doesn't exist, there exists a whole set of different protocols which enable different things to happen. Uh, uh, but the network of networks in many ways affords uh, and presents itself as a very powerful tool, both enabling real-time, asynchronous, independent communicative practices, private and public communicative practices, etc. Um, so it, it, it enables multi-point to multi-point communication, which in a way uh, means inter interaction, interactivity, the networking uh, abilities or affordances of, of the internet uh, to link people up in different parts of the world, again collapsing this time-space continuum, as Giddens uh, uh, pointed out. Uh, it allowed small groups to punch above their weight, so it was easier to kind of scale things up. Uh, maximum impact with limited resources, and, a, and it was a potent mobilization tool, and it also led to what in the literature is called movement spillovers. Uh, think of how the Arab Spring, Indignados, Occupy, how these, these things, can, or the Yellow Vest movements, how that those things are, are uh, start circulating. Um, one of the first examples of the resistance affordances of, of the internet uh, was, of course, the use of it by uh, the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional, or the Zapatista movement, in their fight against large landowners uh, and the dreadful exploitation of indigenous Maya population in Chia Chia Chiapas. With the help of NGOs, such as the Association for Progressive Communication, and activist academics, uh, such as Cleaver, uh, they built up what Cleaver called an electronic fabric of struggle. Uh, and what was most important in, in that particular struggle was how it first, for the first time, it demonstrated how the internet could be used by the powerless to resist and to communicate their struggle, thereby spatially extending the scope of conflict from the local to the global. And in a way, casting a global eye on that local conflict in Mexico, also making in a way, the military and, 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 and uh, be careful because there's a global eye on us. Uh, and besides this, the internet also proved to be a very potent uh, tool in terms of coordinating and mobilizing for direct actions in the offline world. Uh, we could refer here to the profuse use of online forums, chats, uh, and mailing lists to organize and coordinate the so-called Battle of Seattle in 1999, which managed to close down the WTO uh, meetings uh, that were taking place uh, there then. Um, in many ways, the emergence subsequently and success of proprietary social media platforms has in the meantime significantly, significantly altered the way in which activists and movements communicate, organize, and mobilize uh, online. To the extent even, and this is something that, I, that is for me a work in pro progress, to the extent that we could start to reflect on whether those social media and the way in which uh, movements communicate today is altering 
the very ontology of what a social movement is today, just as, in a way, the post-industrial society gave rise to the new social movements post-68, maybe the information society now is also giving rise to new types of movements that are more horizontal, that are more, uh, uh, yeah, spontaneous and, 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 and maybe with a, a bit less stamina. Um, here again, if we bring in uh, the repression, we see that also here uh, states, but increasingly corporate actors controlling the means of communication uh, are reacting against the enormous uh, emancipatory potential of the internet. Uh, and the means they use are unsurprisingly very similar to the ones that I've just discussed in the historical examples that I gave. Censorship, surveillance, jamming, repression, disruption, and counter-propaganda. Uh, just as was the case throughout history, however, activists are also, or have also been very creative and innovative in terms of uh, hacking technologies to enable circumvention in an online context. Uh, this has given rise to uh, what uh, is uh, called, uh, often called uh, the notion of hacktivism uh, or uh, activism gone electronic. Um, for example, there's a hacker collective called the Cult of the Dead Cow. Um, and a subdivision of the Cult of the Dead Cow is called Hacktivismo. Uh, and they developed several tools based on so-called onion root technology, just as the internet, it's technology that was developed by the US military, uh, TOR, the T-O-R network, uh, to enable activists to conceal their identity uh, and, to, and, and, and their IP address, especially when they are browsing, chatting, or emailing. Uh, VPN connections also used often uh, in some contexts to bypass local censorship of content uh, and activists also rely often on powerful encryption technologies to protect content they wish to keep, keep secret uh, in when they are communicating online. We also see a lot of activists uh, reverting back to face-to-face -to -face communication uh, because they do not trust uh, technologies any longer. Uh, um, all this also shows that the internet is not merely facilitative of direct action, but it is also constitutive of direct action. And so what we are also seeing is that the internet is also being used as a weapon. Uh, as uh, think of the hacker collective Anonymous, uh, who uses the internet to target ideological enemies uh, with distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, they are usually symbolic uh, often, but uh, nevertheless, it kind of shows that, that the internet can also uh, be used uh, in, in that regard. Uh, we can also see that, so again, this creativity, an example again of the Hong Kong but then a protest, but then a few years ago when uh, the, the authorities, one of the, 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 the uh, uh, repression, uh, ways of repression is also closing down mobile services in a local area where protest is taking place so that you cannot access services anymore or, or, or uh, and then there are also mesh technologies which allow uh, protesters to create a local network amongst itself without needing mobile technologies or the internet they create uh, a local and every phone connects to every phone uh, and so that they can continue to to, to communicate uh, with each other uh, uh, I also put there the market we have to understand that Social media aren't our, our commercial services. They have terms and conditions. This can be closed down. Uh, um, in Belgium, for example, we see that the extreme right is targeting left-wing activists' uh, social media uh, uh, accounts uh, to, 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 to ban them uh, and report messages uh, to, to social media companies which who then act and, and start closing down. Uh, if you have a blog, for example, and, and, and the content disappears from one day to, to the next because uh, an operator decides this, your archive is gone. Uh, 
So things like that also we have to kind of bear, and certainly if you are anti, let's say, anti-systemic activists, uh, that the, 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 the kind of social media platforms on which these activists often rely today are corporate spaces which can also be uh, illiber become illiberal. Um, I end uh, by also reflecting a little bit on the limitations of the alternative media concept to understand processes of social change and the role of mediation in them, because it's such an important concept in our field. Uh, this historical overview, uh, in a way, exposes the limitations to some extent of this concept to understand processes of social change. Um, ten years ago, uh, together with uh, my friend Nico Carpentier uh, and Olga Bailey, we published a book on alternative media, uh, which, in a way, uh, positioned alternative media as a relational concept. What is alternative? that which is not mainstream. So there's a kind of relation there uh, between mainstream and alternative, uh, a dichotomy that is being uh, uh, constructed. Um, we also see that there was, that there, there, there was a discussion at that time in, 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 in our field between, on the one hand, John Downing and, and Chris Atten. Uh, John Downing writing, <coughs> that alternative media lacks specificity as everything at some point is an alternative to something else. Uh, an alternative media can does include, he wrote, uh, or, or many different things. Uh, but it does not necessarily make any claim of being uh, radical or necessarily empowering or progressive. Um, and that's why we see in the field uh, many different concepts emerging, like Downing uses radical media, you have oppositional media, social movement media, uh, development media, community media, creative media, citizen media, etc., etc. Um, in a way, the problem here is also, certainly if we look at what is happening today, that there are alternative channels of distribution and there is also alternative content. Uh, Alternative channels of distribution, for example, social media, could be seen as an alternative channel of distribution, but not everything that circulates on social media is necessarily alternative content. Uh, there's also an issue of ideology here. Uh, we, in, in the literature, often you see uh, that alternative media is positioned as bottom-up, uh, in the hands of the people, um, as, as progressive, uh, democratic, uh, etc. Um, but we also see that this notion of alternative media is being appropriated, for example, by fascist movements, uh, Breibart, in, in Info Wars, uh, uh, calling them themselves also uh, alternative movements. So the question then becomes, to what is it alternative? Uh, and, and, and as I, I, I also wrote some, some articles uh, 11, 12 years ago about anti-public sphericules that are emerging and, and those were very marginalized at that point, but now unfortunately uh, we see that they are not necessarily marginalized anymore, but that they've become mainstream, uh, that they've become normalized and that, uh, the, and I don't need to uh, tell you the examples, but uh, Brazil, India, US, my own culture, country, Belgium, what is happening in, in the UK at the moment in terms of Brexit. So, so yeah, I think alternative media has, has, has still its use, but we need to be careful with these categories and we also need to be aware that these are also being appropriated. So to conclude, um, popular culture includes social movements and activist communication. Uh, however, as I pointed out, not only con counter-hegemonic content and the symbolic matters, but also technological affordances and materialities. Uh, these materialities and affordances change over time uh, in line with technological innovations, enabling new things to happen, uh, and also activist creativity who recognize those hidden affordances. This dynamic uh, gave rise to a set of activist practices which are circumscribed by these affordances, but also by uh, as I called the mediation opportunity structure, which has both opportunity in it and 
the structural constraints that are inherently put in uh, uh, upon them by the powers uh, that be. Uh, and so this implicates a dialectic, uh, again to use a kind of Giddens uh, concept, between power and resistance, between structure and agency. And to end, unfortunately, uh, popular culture affordances and activist practices are not only the realm of progressive politics, uh, but are also appropriated by fascist, populist, and reactionary uh, movements. Sorry to end on such a depressing note. <laughs> Thank you very much.